Hey everyone, I'm back. I didn't post for a couple of months because in September we all got sick for a few weeks and in October I was just slammed with work and getting ready for this publishing conference but I'm pretty much caught up on things now and I am excited to get back into making some YouTube videos, some booktube videos. So. I mentioned on my Instagram that I'm trying to get away from vlogging so much on YouTube because I just think it's faster and easier to do all my stories to just kind of give quick updates on what I'm reading and I'm reserving YouTube a little bit more for like specific reviews and other kind of bookish topics or deep dives or whatever I feel like doing. So today I feel like doing a review on a series I read fairly recently probably heard me mention it a couple times in some of my vlogs back before September. So I'm going to be talking about The Aurelian Cycle today by Rosaria Munda and I know I've already talked about it a lot but I just have a lot to say so I'm just, I'm just going to keep talking about it and we're going to pass more books. So I'm just going to give you a quick overview of the premise right where we start off and I'm gonna kind of go through some basic non-spoiler review items of the first three books and then I'm gonna dive into like spoilers and really talk a lot about that because I have so much to say and I hope that this review just gives you guys an idea of if you want to read this series or if you've already read it and you're just dying to talk with somebody about it hopefully this is like cathartic to hear my thoughts on it and you can totally comment and, and share your own thoughts um, because there's a lot a lot to say and overall I really enjoyed the series and so I'm excited to just talk about the things that I loved and of course also the things that I didn't love because you always have to talk about that right I guess you don't always have to okay it's fine it's fine we're gonna talk about lots of things okay so the Aurelian cycle is three books Fireborn, Flamefall, and Fury Song and it's set in a fantasy world, but you can really tell by the geography that it's set in like in like a European geography, if that makes sense. I can also especially tell because the audiobook narrators, they do specific accents depending on where people are from and stuff, and, and that really also shows like they're playing into European geography in the world building. So the main continent is like England, right? And there's kind of like the Highlands, which is like Scotland, Wales area, right? There's also an island country called Norcia, which is Ireland. And then there's like the bigger continent where there's a few different countries at play, right? Um, but one of the main countries you can tell is meant to be inspired by the Germanic countries. Basilica? Basilia? Sorry, I don't remember the country name very well. And within the main kingdom that's like set in like this England type, land, right? Um, it doesn't feel like England, which is cool. To me, it actually feels a lot like the Fire Nation from Avatar The Last Airbender. And I thought those were some really cool vibes going on. And part of the reason it really feels like this is because the, the ruling, like the, the rulers of this kingdom were dragon lords, right? They have dragons that they can ride and use in battle. And they also use these dragons to rule their people. They are, they were really oppressive rulers. They were tyrants. And the story starts after this family of dragon lord rulers have actually been overthrown. It, it reminds me actually quite a bit of like the the fall of um, Anastasia's family in Russia, right? There's like a, a rebellion, kicks the, the royal family out, and this new government rises up in its place that is supposed to be more fair, giving people more rights and, and all these things. And one of the biggest changes they make is that they allow anybody to test to become a dragon rider because previously it was only like the noble dragonborns, like it was very much like a blood thing, right? So we come to a point where we have our two main characters, Lee. He was actually one of the sons of the current dragon lord, king, ruler person. I'm sorry, I can't remember if he's like an emperor or a king or what his title is, but he's, he's the ruler. <laughs> and so his son Lee was about eight when this all happened. He remembers like the attack and the brutality and the violence. It's traumatic but he was spared he was smuggled away he survived and he was left basically in an orphanage where he grew up and had to learn like the common tongue and and just pretend that he was a nobody right we also have annie who's who grew up as basically a nobody up in 
the highlands and she was very poor and her family was all killed by the dragon lord ruler when she was a kid because they were just trying to store extra food to survive the winter and he was trying to collect food from everybody and he was like nope you're all dying as an example but he let annie survive so that she would remember and be a reminder for everybody else and it was so brutal and harsh and so she like absolutely hates like the old dragon lord rulers thing right she also lives in this orphanage the same one that Lee is in and they actually become best friends and they over time realize kind of like what roles the dragon lords you've played in both of their lives and it's hard for them but it's also incredibly like it just their relationship kind of evolves because they learn to see both sides of what was going on Anyway, a lot of background for you to understand who Lee and Annie are. They both tested to become dragon riders and they are good enough and smart enough that they've been training and they are like competing to become the like first rider, which is basically like the captain of like the army, basically. And they have dragons. It's cool. And then Lee finds out that he's not the only Anastasia type person in this scenario, like in this world. There are other family members of his who did survive that horrible like wiping out of all the dragon lords and he finds out that they are trying to come back and take what's theirs and and get back into power and he suddenly realizes like his family that he he loved them genuinely and he saw a lot of good in them and he now has to figure out am i going to support my family who i do love and i i'm so relieved to find out that somebody else survived right does he go back to them or does he stand for this new government that he has been finding his place in and finding a lot of a lot of good in right so he has some great conflicts there and annie has her own conflicts of trying to prove herself because she's got a lot of prejudices to overcome anyway so there's an impending war and lots lots going on so that's the overall like start of how this goes we see perspectives in both Lee and Annie's perspectives and then we also have flashbacks to Lee's and Annie's childhoods and like a third person narrator thing. Right, so let's dive into talking about Fireborn specifically, the first book in this trilogy. And I've talked about this before, but oh my goodness, Rosaria Munda is so good at creating believable, relatable characters. Like the people in the story really felt real. Like Lee has these real conflicts that I've already mentioned, Annie has these conflicts that I've also kind of hinted at, and those play into their relationship with each other and how they interact and it creates awkward tension and there's also like this kind of romance blossoming between them but then like Lee also feels attraction to somebody else and, and Annie's like kind of got this other guy interested in her and like, and, and what's great about that is that these love triangles are, they're not just like, oh, I want Lee to have to choose between two people and oh, I want Annie to have to choose between two people. It's not like that at all. It's actually just real kids. These are all like 18-ish year old kids here, right? So it's, it's almost like a high school of kids who are learning to become dragon riders. That, that Lee and Annie are living with. And not, not as big as a high school, like there's not a ton of them, but there's like enough of them, right? That they have like a school. And they're, they're just these teenagers really who are trying to figure out life, trying to navigate these difficult political things and learning how to fly dragons. And they're also just learning out, <laughs> learning out, what? And they're also just figuring out how they feel about each other. And Lee and Annie have a lot to navigate in their relationship, especially because they have these really difficult things in their past and it's, it's a lot. It's a lot. Every like person like Krissa, Power, Rock, Core, Duck, even Dorian to an extent, like they're all so different and individual um, in this group of, of writers. And it's really, really cool to just see that the characters just are so real. They're great. They're great. Kind of as like a counterpoint to that, the plot of Fireborn at times felt not as in, not as nearly as engaging as the characters were. And this might have been more of like a personal thing for me because it just didn't it just never felt fresh. This idea of like there's this rebellion that took over the government and there's this like other rebellion trying to happen with like the Dragon Lords coming back. Like it just it all felt so I've been here before. 
and not very original. And so I was just kind of, I was really there for the characters was the reason I kept reading. Um, eventually, once we got to about the 75% mark and like on, things kind of, I wouldn't say they necessarily picked up, but they started, they started developing in more interesting ways and things where I was expecting the story to go didn't necessarily go there and there was nothing mind-blowing in the way the plot was constructed but there was enough at the end of the story that was satisfying and just enough of a twist that I was intrigued enough to go on to book two. I would say the plotting of the story was average but the character work was like way above average, like some of the best character work I've ever seen and it only got better as the series got on. The other kind of big drawback of book one was that all the action scenes felt very lackluster. Like there would be a dragon fight and it would feel like the whole essence of it was like this person got this many hits on this person and this person got this many hits on this person and that's how we totaled up in this person one. And it was definitely more than that, but it always just felt like, oh, and this person got a hit, and it wasn't, it wasn't very immersive or engaging. So I also wanted just a little bit more of understanding how the writers' connections with their dragons worked. We got like hints of it, um, but not not as much as would have been fun to really explore. Sometimes that's a, something I really love about getting involved in like a new book, a new series, is that there's like well, at least when it's fantasy, <laughs> there's like a whole world to explore. There's usually some sort of magic system involved. And so the dragons are basically like the magic system, the world building, right? And I just wanted to be able to explore that a little bit more. And, and there was a little bit, but I just, I wanted a little bit more. <laughs> but like I said, the ending was really satisfying and made me want to go on to book two. So let's talk about book two. Flame fall. That's what it's called. They all start with F and it's it's easy to forget which one is which. <laughs> so again, the characters and the character relationships in this book just continued to shine and just knock it out of the park. And it was really cool that like the world building and the plot kind of broadened in what felt like a very natural way, which especially was good for me because it wasn't as satisfying in book one and it just, it got better in book two. One thing that comes up is that you start to see the people in Norcia. That Norcia is where the original dragon lords were like banished to if they survived. So you see there where the dragon lords have kind of taken over this small island country that has a hard time fending for itself. And so you meet basically the um, squire slash lover of one of Lee's relatives. Um, I'm sorry, I can't remember his name, but he's really cool and I loved his perspective. It was really fun getting to know him and his character. Along with the world building and plot kind of opening up, the action scenes did get a little bit better. So, you know, progress was made. That was good. But I will say the big thing with this one is that I was really frustrated with like Lee and Annie and their group of writers. They were doing some really difficult like political things and moral questions and because they, they just, they were in a tough spot and had to make hard decisions. And they and it's not like they were the ones really in charge, right? They there were other government people who were really actually in charge and dictating things. But it just felt like based on the characters of Lee and Annie that have been established so firmly in book one, it just seemed like they should have been trying harder in book two to do the right thing and not just sit back and say, Okay, whatever you say, my leader. You know, like it just it just often felt unbelievable that they would just be too cowardly to say anything and stand up for something. And not that they all held back all the time and, and some people were definitely more more willing to speak up than others. But it still overall felt like, like not justified enough, but strangely enough, the, the characters themselves still just felt so real and believable it's kind, it was kind of tricky <laughs> I wonder if it's not more just me being angry that they didn't do more because when I think about it like they're just they're really just teenagers who are taking orders from older more experienced people as their leaders and I mean a kind of military training in them would dictate that they shouldn't really question or or push back on those orders. So like, it makes sense, 
but I don't know. It was just, there were a couple times where I was like, I don't know, just, it felt like we needed a little bit more push back in some way, even if it wasn't them directly confronting their leaders. So anyway, is that big enough for you? <laughs> okay, so finally in Fury Song, let me just say again how incredible the character work was and all of their arcs and their relationships and how those developed. Like it is just... Like I don't often laugh out loud, like literally laugh out loud when I read books and I don't often literally start crying when I read books. Like I just... I just, I feel all the emotions inside and just kind of let them all sit inside me. And once in a while I might squeal or like breathe harder or like sometimes kind of do a little, <laughs> like little chuckle, like sometimes, right? But most of the time I just, I, I kind of just keep all the emotions inside, right? But I, I almost started crying once or twice in this book, like, and that's huge for me. So the character work was just like out of the park, incredible. I was also really surprised at how a couple plot points just really satisfied me, it just and they surprised me in how much they satisfied me. Like Annie went through some really ridiculously hard things in book two, and she did her best, and she wasn't really a bad person, but got treated like a bad person. And in book three, like all this justice comes to her, and I just I wasn't expecting it. And it just, it, but it happened and I didn't realize how much I wanted that. Because in, in book two, I was all like, no, 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 Annie, please, no, this is the worst. Ah, oh, Annie, Annie, I'm sorry. And then I kind of just accepted it. I was like, well, this is just kind of Annie's lot now. Like, it's, it's not fun, but this is just what she has to deal with, I guess. And then suddenly, kind of in like the last third or so of book three, it was like, Annie's getting what she deserves. Yes, and like I just, and I just didn't. I had, I thought I had accepted what happened, but suddenly, like it was just, oh, yeah, like I didn't realize how much I wanted her to have justice. Like, oh, it was so good. Juxtaposed to that, even though that was so so satisfying. Like the last, I'd say like the last third especially. It was just like, oh my goodness, so many things unfolding and happening, and yes. But the first like third or so well, it felt very very slow to me and it felt like literally everybody was just moping around because of the bad things that had happened at the very end of book two and we, they were just they were kind of moving on and getting things done but mostly just moping and that that just it just felt like the pacing was a little too slow it would especially affect me okay so in this book we add yet another perspective we add Dilo. He's another one of the surviving Dragonlord people, you know, close to Lee's age. And and he's much more compassionate to, like, peasants, right? Like, he's not such a tyrant as many of his family members are. And the thing about his perspective is that he was the guilty one of being the one who was moping and doing nothing most of the time in that, like, first third of the book <laughs> and in a sense I really liked getting this perspective because it was great to again see that like conflict of like family or or these principles of democracy right like which how do you balance wanting to have both right um the kind of a similar conflict that Lee had it was like fine nice to see that but we didn't we didn't need it I felt like because one we've already seen that kind of conflict with Lee and it was really well done and great and we don't we don't necessarily need more of that, at least not from a direct perspective. Two, like I said, a lot of the time, Dilo did nothing. It, like, he had, like, there was literally, like, a chapter where he literally just thought about how sad he was and angry he was and all these things that he, like, wished were different. And it never mentioned, like, he thought about this while he was doing this menial task, or he thought about this while he was eating lunch. Like, no, no hint of any actual action happening. Like, literally just him staring at his belly button thinking these things. Like, what we call navel gazing. And <laughs> I got to a point where I put down the book for a little bit because his perspective came up again, and I was like, I do not want another chapter of D'Lo just being a mope and hanging out and doing nothing. So, it bugged me a little bit in that first third that it slowed down a bit. And in a sense I get it, like it was, everybody was in a pretty rough time and, and you know, it's not like, not like they could always do that much, but I just, I don't know, it needed, it needed to 
move along a little bit more or at least have more everyday action to help us get through all the mopiness that makes sense. So overall I would cut Dilo's perspective if I could because I, I see why she wanted to include it but I feel like it either was poorly done like it's just not executed right or unnecessary and it would it would in my opinion it would need a little bit of reworking and tweaking to make the parts that like mattered work right. There's some stuff in the climax that I just I would rework it if I could. I've, re I've been mentioning the action scenes in the past, how they weren't so good, and they were definitely at their best in the third book. Still not like, not as good as like the character work, right? Because how can you beat her character work and her relationship arcs? Like, whew. But the action did get so much better. Like, it, it felt like I didn't have, didn't feel like such a big disparity between the two. <laughs> and the last thing I'll say about this book is that the ending was so good, so satisfying. I really loved how things came together, except just the way that Annie's last decision was framed, it just frustrated me. Anyway, I'll talk more in the spoilers about why that made me so mad, but <laughs> everything else in the ending I thought was was great, and it was a, it was overall a pretty satisfying conclusion, especially how all the character arcs turned out. That's that's what really made this book so memorable in so many ways. Okay, so we've talked about all three books and we're gonna jump into talking about some spoilers about the series in general and then I'll wrap up with some like last thoughts about, you know, overall things so that if you want to skip spoilers, skip to the end, the wrap up, and you can, you can be spared the spoilers. I think what I want to talk about most is Power and Annie. So, a reminder, if it's been a while since you've read the books, or if you just want to be caught up on what goes on between them, Power is like a bully in the, like, Dragon Riders in Annie and Lee's kind of, like, class, right? And he's, he's, he's a jerk. <laughs> he, and he is a little bit sadistic, too. Like, I just, yeah, he's, he's a bully. And he, in the first book, he actually takes time with Annie to train her on how to like connect like completely with her dragon and they call it a spillover it's like an emotional connection where you like you kind of have to let go of control of your emotions in order to become one with your dragon's emotions right it's a cool thing and like he just kind of naturally does it and so he's training Annie to do it so that she can you know win her dragon fighting competition stuff and he's a jerk about it he like the way he does it is by like making her so so mad by saying like rude things about her and her friends and getting her angry enough to like lose control right because I mean how else are you gonna lose control of your emotions when you're so careful about it the whole time so that's kind of power's role in the first book um, but what's interesting is there's this fine balance that you can sense that like he he legitimately wants to help Annie in this and even though he's not like the nicest person you can tell that he he really is supporting her and wants her to win which is like almost contrary to the way he acts about her being like a peasant right like he's anyway so it's really cool to see that like he really believes in her and then in book two he also is just like by her side all the time Lee and Annie really butt heads over like how to handle like food collections and doling out rations to people and stuff and handling all these hungry people who are starving like Lee is more like I think we need to kind of revolutionize things and Annie's like I think I need to uphold order <laughs> both are trying to do good things but they're not happy with each other and Annie's like I said she's going through so much because everybody is Everybody thinks that she's the bad guy and that she's the one driving all these bad decisions and all she's doing is trying to carry out what her leaders are saying and she's doing her best to protect people but she's also trying to have a firm hand about it and power is just like there to support her and and do whatever she needs and again he's not a nice guy but he is like there for her in everything and they have this like really touching moment at the near the end of book two where they're I mean, everybody's basically starving, and he has stockpiled some food, and it's rotting, but he shares some with her anyway, because they're starving. And he basically admits that he has feelings for her, that he 
that he loves her. And she's like, oh, this is super awkward. I mean, kind of beyond awkward. Like, she doesn't like him. She doesn't think he's really a good person. I mean, she, in a way, she trusts him because she knows that he's got her back and he's helped her with a lot of things. But she's like, there's no way she would consider ever being with him because it's just, they, they definitely have some different moral boundaries. And, and I just felt for him so much. I just, because I can see why he's so attracted to her. And I, and I also love how much she trusts him and relies on him in some important ways. But I also totally agree that like, there's no way Annie would ever go for him. <laughs> and I was just like, oh, poor power. Ah, oh, he like has a heart. And I just, it made me really want to see like an alternate universe where they actually get together. Like, I just, I want to see that fanfiction story where for some reason things are different enough that they fall in love, like, legitimately. Like, I want to see that story because Power is just such a fascinating character to me. You just start to see so many, so many aspects of depth and uh, conflict and complication to him. Like, he's a complex character and so well done. In the third book, oh, again, he's, he's... He's being him where he's not like a nice person and he's also kind of like a survivor. He's doing what it takes to survive even when, you know, Ixion, the bad dragon lord dude who survived, he, he comes and, and Power just pretends to be his right hand man and be like, yeah, dude, I hate peasants too, right? And, and the moment when he, he's basically caught because he's been helping Annie, like secretly as much as he could showing where his true loyalties lie even though he has a lot of other people fooled because he's a jerk <laughs> and there's a moment where he gets caught by Ixion and he says it's because I mean, he does this so flippantly he says because I'm head over heels for Antigone right and he he's like it's totally totally unrequited so you know but I'm just it's uh, I'm help helplessly in love with her <laughs> he says that's why he's betrayed them. And I, I, I love that moment because he was being so flippant and sarcastic about it, pretending like he was just almost making an excuse, right? But I could tell that that's really why. Because he he really was like head over heels and had to, and had to help her, whatever it took. Anyway, and so at the end, just his sacrifice for her was incredible man so i think power actually might have been my favorite character in this whole series just learning his complexities and his different sides and just seeing how how his loyalty to annie drove him oh, incredible that's another thing i've got to mention one reason these characters felt so real is because they were driven by like guiding principles they didn't just have strength and weak strengths and weaknesses like you're I feel like writers are always told, like, think about your character's strengths and weaknesses and make sure they have these different characteristics. But, like, literally, these characters were driven to make each decision based on these, like, core values that they had. Like, for instance, loyalty or surviving or um, justice or um, compassion, right? There's these different core values that these characters had that really influenced how they interacted with others and made important decisions. And it's just... It blew me away. Okay, I think I've already talked enough about Annie's second trial and just how much that meant to me and why. And I was vague enough that like I don't, I, I don't think I have that much more to say about it. Except I do want to add that like Freda, Freda, I think that's her name, loved her hand and things. Just and I, I loved the depth to her character too. She was, she was more than just the princess on the side, right? Anyway, love that. Okay, the last thing I want to talk about before my battery dies is Annie's decision at the very end of the books. So she was basically, the whole time in book three, she's thinking about what it would be like to just give up dragon writing and just be a normal person and be able to have like a family with somebody like Lee. <laughs> and then the other side of her is like her duty is so important to her and she's given everything to like be the first writer and it's her duty is, is so much to her, right? And, and she she wants both. And at the end, it basically implies that like she can't have both. She has to choose one or the other. And the, basically, she gives off the vibe that like, you know what, I'm going to choose my dragon rider responsibilities and then once I retire, you know what, then I can have a life with Lee. <laughs> and I was like, no, 
You don't have to choose work over motherhood. Well, my battery died. And I'm back. I think I was saying you don't have to do one or the other. It, I mean, if you only want one, cool, fine, that's your choice. But she wanted both. And like, I know that there was a whole like, they didn't want dragon riders like be passed off through blood anymore. And they also didn't want like family coming before your duty, which is why they were saying like no family. But they were at a point where they were gonna start changing a bunch of things in the government and I was like you could change that policy you like Annie had the power she she totally could have made a case to have both she totally could have like and like I understand there was some nuance to the situation but just the way it was framed it just felt like this really awful like okay you can either be happy with a family or be happy in your career no other options and I was like that is not how life works <laughs> like not for everybody at least you can have both and be very happy and it's okay especially if you want both and want to pursue that like I said if you only want one or the other you just go for one fine that's your choice but Annie wanted both and she could have had it so I'm just not happy about that <laughs> everything else in the ending was really satisfying though so that's that's just the one thing that struck me as not okay <laughs> but let's wrap this up now and let me just kind of recap why I enjoyed this series overall like I've mentioned it has a few flaws but overall it's, overall I really enjoyed it and and would recommend it to most anyone who enjoys fantasy the series sometimes gets a little bit dark without getting like gruesome or gritty and without ever really losing hope there are hard things and hard questions but really good people who are trying to make the best with what they have and ultimately finding good solutions. Like I've said, the characters are so real, so vibrant, so realistic. They come alive and they have great conflicts that help move the story along. Even though the plot's not always totally riveting, the conflicts, especially the, especially the inner conflicts, are usually just riveting. And the more that I think about it, if you are truly a plot-driven reader, this might not be the series for you just because some of the plot may feel a little too predictable and a little too like uncomplicated I guess I don't know but if you're hoping to get more into character driven books this would be a great place to start because the characters are amazing obviously if you like characters and plots the same then I think you'll enjoy this book too because great characters and decent plots that are sometimes great plots Anyway, give The Aurelian Cycle a try, and if you have already read it, let me know what you thought, if you agree with some of the things that I've said, or if there's something else that you really enjoyed or didn't enjoy that you would maybe disagree with me. And if you're planning to read it, let me know. I want to hear anyone who's going to read it enjoy The Aurelian Cycle, and let's pass more books.